this morning I go to check your profile <laughs> and I see Iman Godzi profile banned. <laughs> or, or at least not active or not available. So what happens? Um, I mean, look, you can make up uh, 101 different theories. Um, yeah, so I woke up this morning, probably had 500 messages, team, friends, et cetera, et cetera. My Instagram has been deactivated. First time in uh, in seven years. So, wow. yeah, look, there's a couple different options. Uh, I definitely don't think, uh, like Tate, it was from, uh, you know, uh, Instagram themselves. So, uh, yeah, definitely not that route. But most people don't realize. But for a few hundred dollars, some of the smaller accounts, you can get them banned in two seconds. Um, you know, for as cheap as even $150, some, uh, $100, $50 sometimes, account with a few thousand followers, you can get take it down like this. Um, so it's a bit of a nuisance, but then to get it reinstated also isn't too, too difficult. Uh, it's first 24 hours, so we'll see. Um, you know, I'll definitely be a little bit more concerned if it's been four or five days and still not up, but yeah, I'm pretty confident I'll, I'll get it back. Someone, basically someone probably paid for an account from my side, uh, my size probably paid five, six thousand dollars to get it taken down. But weirdly enough, Sneeko, who's definitely a very... A uh, controversial character. He posted a photo of me and a, uh, one of my buddies called Jordan Welch. Last night we went for dinner the other night, and uh, Jordan's account got taken down too. I saw that. So, um, yeah, you know, I think it's someone who maybe doesn't like Sneeko or maybe doesn't like all of us, or maybe who knows. But um, yeah, in four or five days, I guess we'll see. Well, you've been on an absolute tear social wise. I think I saw 100 million views in a month. Yeah, last month uh, between. Uh, TikToks, Reels, and YouTube Shorts, we did 89 million. Wow. And so what was the concerted effort to grow your social profiles tremendously? You've been on online on YouTube since, what, 2015, 2016? 2015, yeah. And so now you're just actually making an effort to go crazy and, and really get seen. What What was the switch that flipped? I don't know what it was. I just, at the beginning of the year, I kind of set, because I've, you know, I like to stick to maybe three, four, maximum five goals for the year. This was the first year ever in my life where I set a YouTube subscriber goal. And that goal was 500K and we hit it, um, I think, earlier in the month, actually. So right now we're doing around 100, 110,000 new subs a month. And it takes a lot of work. I mean, I've been uploading on YouTube since 2015, but I always uploaded just more for me. Like I'd say this is the first year where I'm uploading with a actual focus on growth. Even last year, I was just uploading just because I'm like, it's just nice. Like I just like to share my journey. I like to share uh, what I, what's working, what's not working. But this is the first year where I'm like, okay, the goal is actually to grow because I feel like I had a message that was worth hearing. But I also understood it doesn't matter what your message is. It, it also matters. You do need to placate into the algorithms. You do need to at least have some sort of a strategy in place. So at the beginning of the year, I told my team we're going to hit 500k subs this year. That's the goal, and obviously we managed to do it. I think we're on pace to end the year at 850, 900k. So there's a couple of things that went into it. I mean, even right now we have three full-time YouTube thumbnail editors. So I'm spending, uh, what, $8,000 a month just on YouTube thumbnails, and they're all in-house full-time. Now, I upload one YouTube video a week. So you might be asking yourself, how do three people work full-time just on one YouTube video? Well, they're doing that, and then each week they're going back and rehashing like 10 YouTube videos. And that's one of the, you know, I could probably not upload for the rest of the year. I'll still do 100K a month, right, just because they're going back and they're rehashing old videos and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's one example. In terms of the 89 million we did last month on the redistribution platforms, I, look at, I looked at what Tate did, and I was like, this is genius. But, you know, one of the advantages of not being the first mover but seeing how someone else did it is you get to see some of the shortcomings. And the only issue with him, and I've seen a few other uh, people try to do it, uh, you know, the affiliate marketing strategy, is you've got these affiliates that are posting on your behalf, but let's say there's a narrative that you don't want to go out, a narrative that you don't like. Let's say... You know, the issue is, you know, you'll have uh, Tate or you'll have some of these other people and they've, their affiliates are obviously incentivized to clip up things in, in a way that almost portrays them badly to get the most amount of views. And the issue is, let's say there's something because, it's I mean, you know, I've even talked to my team and, you know, I've got a Spencer who's incredible and he's my head of uh, content redistribution. We actually have 19 full time people wow. full time. They work for us, us only daily team calls. They're part of the full culture of my company. And, you know, I even had, had to have a word with Spencer about certain clips that have gone up because they'll take a five minute, uh, you know, they'll take a five minute interview and then they clip it into 22 seconds. And it's 
I literally didn't even say that. Like mm. the way you stitch it together, it's just something that it's so far from what was actually said in the in the full uh, long form content. But the benefit is that's my team, right? So I can come in and we can readjust and we can be agile and we can say, okay, that actually isn't a good representation of the brand. And even, you know, I guess I'm giving everything away here. I even told my team, uh, and we're gonna action this in one or two months. In one or two months, I don't want any more talking head videos. And in fact, actually, uh, this plus I'm, I'm doing one more. This will be the last podcast I've decided to do in the next two to three years. Wow. Because as well, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. I've realized I'm not a master order, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking is not my strong suit. I'm a little bit more on the autistic spectrum. <laughs> you know, I'm a little bit on the more, you know, I can be, I can be quite, um, I can be quite engaging and I can be quite gregarious, but I don't get my energy from being around people. I get my energy from being alone. Mm -hmm. So I'm not made for podcasts, right? I, I do them just cause I like having uh, long format conversations and, you know, hanging out with incredible people such as yourself, but that's not really my medium. So even now I can go and I can tell my team, Hey guys, in one or two months, we're going more this direction, right? The more visual direction. The thing I understand very well is brand public perception. You know, I understand how to kind of piece these things together and, um, obviously, you know, my first ever business, a creative agency, my background is in fo photo video. Mm. So we're going a little bit more sort of the visual direction with the content redistribution next team, uh, team next year. Whereas if I had affiliates, I couldn't do that. Right. So obviously the downside is I have a, you know, multiple, multiple five figure a month cost to run this team with no like clear cut ROI. It's not like they're br bringing me back money and then I'm giving them some money as affiliates. Like that's some cost, but it's, you know, it, I guess in my stage and, you know, running the businesses I run, I feel comfortable, you know, making that trade off. So, um, yeah, that's basically, and that, that's never been done before on that scale. People want to do the affiliates, but people aren't willing to spend, you know, multiple, multiple, you know, tens of thousands a month to have this team with no clear cut ROI, except for let's just get the message out there. You're building brand and yeah. you're building awareness for yeah. yourself. Yeah. But you said earlier, Ex I'd say actually, uh, you know, sorry to please, interrupt you, please. except for Gary V, right? Like he's a perfect example of that, where it's like, I don't know what the ROI is on this today, but I know there's going to be an ROI in the future, but he, I don't think he, he didn't do any of the redistribution channels and stuff like that. You know, like we have, I think at the moment, like 22 accounts mm -hmm. between the different platforms. So it's kind of like taking a, a love child of the best of what Gary V did and the best of what Andrew Tate did. And basically looking at it and being like, let's still be in control. Let's still be in control of the brand. And we get to decide what goes out and what doesn't. Um, but then let's also not just rely on one platform or one account. Let's have multiple different accounts spread out. So you are going to be switching more to a visual direction. What does that right. mean exactly? What that means is, look, I do very, very cool things. And I'm also a very, although I'm very public, I'm very private. And the thing is, I do things that sometimes I don't realize that it's not normal, but mm -hmm. I guess it's just, uh, obviously I'm in a weird situation where I started my first business at 16. I made my first million at 18. And it's like, I guess certain things just become normal to me. Yeah. Like the other day I was at, you know, I was just, I landed here. I landed in Miami at 11, um, you know, got to the hotel, um, after a, a good fight with TSA. Oh man, I, uh, yeah. TSA always gives me issues. I've got a, I was born in Dagestan in Russia. The last name. So, because uh, Gadji is just my shortened last name, my mm -hmm. full last name, Gajima Gamedov. I mean, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a walking red flag for TSC, <laughs> even though I've got a British passport. So, um, yeah, after having a little bit of issues with them, got to my hotel uh, and then, you know, went out for lunch and then did a bit of shopping, did some shopping, spent probably a hundred, hundred and ten thousand dollars to me. That's normal. I don't feel like I need to post it. I don't feel like I need to make a video out of it. Whereas for other people, that's just like, you know, for me to go out and just do a bit of shopping, spend 20,000, 50, 000, like it's, or, you know, go pick up a $300,000 watch. That's just like, I don't know. I don't like to document my life like that, but I understand for other people, they love to see the fact that, oh, in 2015, I started my business. And in 2015, I've literally got clips of me being like, I can't afford to take Ubers. I'm so excited until the business picks up because I hate taking the bus. And like, you can see those clips in 2015. And then to see where I am now, I think it's very inspiring for people, but I don't really give people a, a, a peek into sort of my actual day to day life. I don't give people a peek into the fact that I've got my wedding, uh, my um, employees wedding in Mexico in a few days. And, you know, my team is flying out, uh, you know, some of my team is coming out here, you know, I'm taking 10 of my employees, you know, we're taking a, a nice uh, a Falcon jet, you know, to go to Mexico there and back, it's $100,000. And so you want to document that journey, as yeah. opposed to 
talk on podcasts and be exactly. a talking head. And right. I think you are really good on podcasts. But I, I think that it's not my special. Everyone has their thing where they understand that better than anyone else. And yeah. that is their competitive advantage. But 10 and, years, give you 10 years. Like if, if you wanted to do that, you would be really good. And you will be really good at 31 regardless. I, I do agree. But then I also think about it. And I think I also plan years in advance and I look at where are things going. And I think there's a time for everything, right? Everyone has their time. You know, if you think about even like 2014 to 2017 uh, or 16, it was that like Gymshark, Alpha lead, fitness, influ and you know that, I'm not saying that's gone, but that's died out in some senses. People want to see something different, right? I mean, early 2000s, you've got, you know, people want to be as, guys want to be as big as humanly possible. Then you've got Kino Body that comes in and whatever it was like 2015, 2016 is like, no, you just want to look athletic. Mm -hmm. So everything goes in cycles. And I think, you know, there's been, um, you know, there's been between Tate, between Fresh and Fit, like there's a lot of like talking head stuff. And at a certain point, it's, I'd say Tate's different because he can talk about literally anything and make it entertaining. Yeah. But then you've got guys like Fresh and Fit, which, you know, I have so much respect for them. I was, I was meant to go out there on their podcast, but uh, they're in Romania. But it's at a certain point, it's how much can you watch of the same sort of content? And it's, it, it, you know, one of my friends messaged me the other day and he's like, dude, you're, you're killing it right now on all the social platforms. You know, there's very few people that are doing my sort of numbers at the moment. Yeah. And, I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but it's not about, you know, it's not about do, doing well. It's how, how uh, it's not about, you know, getting to the top, uh, which I certainly am not at the moment, but, you know, up there, it's how long can you stay there? Right. And for me, I look at things and I'm like, mm, I don't know if in a year people are still going to want the same talking head videos, podcast. So I, I just think, I'll give you another example. Uh, in 2015, 2016, people freaked out for like the Jay Alvarez, uh, Jon Olsen, I think was another one, like, that's sort of like vlog lifestyle-y stuff. Um, even one of my uh, good friends, a guy called Adam Horowitz, he ran a channel called Wolves. And like, it was just like daily sort of fun lifestyle vlogs. And I'll be honest, there's nothing on earth I would r rather do less than do a vlog. I, I, I don't enjoy that, but I just look at the way that things are going. And I think that is gonna come back around where people want to see sort of the intimate details of someone's life. And if I do that for a year or two years, um, you know, I think it's, yeah, I think I think it'll be, I think the market is kind of changing and I don't know what's next. I'm taking a bet on that, but I think that'll work. And one of the biggest comments that I get from people is, because on my YouTube, on my YouTube, I'm very, very vanilla, I'm very vanilla, like, uh, or at least for my standards, I try to stay a little bit more PG vanilla on YouTube unless I go on podcasts. Um, you know, I think if you went on my main YouTube channel, you'd think that I'm just one of those YouTube finance guys, like, whereas I'm the complete opposite. I have very, um, I wouldn't say radical views, but I have very different views to most people, I guess you could say. Uh, whereas on my Instagram, that's where I'm super unfiltered. And I think people want to see a little bit more of that side on YouTube. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm taking a bet and we'll see. Yeah, well, I appreciate the thoughtfulness you put into everything you do. And I also appreciate that you're the type of person where if you set your mind to it, it's going to get done. And one example of that was running a marathon on two weeks notice. What happened there? Um, so look, 2020, I had a very, very difficult year. Obviously, it was interesting with, you know, everything shutting down and whatnot. I was actually in Cape Town and right at the beginning of the year, I had gone through a breakup and then that was, it was actually the best thing because I'd gone through a breakup and then I was in Cape Town with me and my buddy Pete and we were just stuck in a house and all I did was work, meditate. I did a bunch of fasting, which is very, a very, very spiritual experience doing fasts, you know, two day fast, three day fasts. And it was, it was great. I was living life. I was having a great time. I came back and then in the summer of 2020, I fell into a very, very bad depressive episode. And then I also got a very bad auto, like it was an autoimmune condition, but a very intense version of it, a psoriasis. Uh, where basically you just have like flaky scales all over your body and it's just and you know if, if you don't leave a tree in, uh, for long enough then it turns into psoriatic ar arthritis so then that has many many other issues and you know i was going to the most expensive doctors in the world in london harley street and they're like yeah you can't fix it but take the steroid cream and it'll go away and i'm like i've never believed i mean from a young age i haven't even take, taken painkillers i've taken painkillers once in my life and it was when i was playing football or soccer for some of your audience and I was playing for my school and I tore my hip flexor and dislocated my shoulder at the same time, but I still scored a goal. It was after I fell 
uh, after scoring a goal. And I had a, a tournament the next day, or sorry, three days later. So I took the highest strength painkillers. But apart from that, I've never taken painkillers in my entire life. No medication, anything. And yeah, when they told me, you know, you've got this horrible... And, and also, it's, it's just a terrible thing because it's, you know, I, I feel as though if you go to, through... There's some autoimmune conditions, which they're all terrible, but it's some where you go through and, you know, I guess it's sort of like a personal thing because, you know, let's say you've got, um, you know, even, um, you know, IBS or something, which a lot of people have, like it's, that's kind of like your personal journey to go through, you know, <laughs> not everyone needs to know about that. Whereas when you've got like scaly flaky skin and so, it's so visual, it's so there. <laughs> and uh, especially when you're uploading YouTube videos and stuff like that. So, uh, I started doing a bunch of research as I always do on anything and everything and I was like okay no I can fix this so for six to seven weeks I did a carnivore only diet first three weeks it was just beef salt water and then I went uh, cut out alcohol cut out caffeine and after eight weeks I was fully fully healed uh, doctors were like I've never seen anything like this before and I, I I went off like that was one of the few times I got so angry at them and I was like honestly I, shame on you Shame on you for the fact that you've got people in here who are you're, who are coming in here and looking at you as a beacon of knowledge and as, as a beacon of hope. And you're telling them you've got this thing that you can never, ever, ever, ever cure in your life. And you're 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 shattering their entire future, their entire dreams and hopes by telling them, yeah, you're just it, it's always going to be there. But you might be able to alleviate some of the side effects. So, uh, yeah, you know, I went through that in summer of 2020. So between getting this, uh, cause that kind of throws you off when you've got something like that in your life. And it's, I mean, at the time it was more of an inconvenience than anything. Cause it's, I spent a four to eight weeks basically just becoming an expert on skin health and, you know, gut microbiome. And I was already into detoxing and stuff like that, but then having to learn like gut microbiome, having to do crazy things. I mean, I was already doing fasting before then, but crazy things that I, you know, even I had one of my uh, buddies who is one of my close friends who is a detox coach and he's been through very, very difficult things in his life. He was a professional uh, fighter. And then, uh, you know, he went through, uh, you know, horrible uh, suicidal thoughts and depression for three years. And then basically it turned out that it was um, a mercury poisoning. And this is why I always tell people like, I, I've i experienced depression, right? But I don't believe that, I don't believe you can get depressed for no reason. I don't believe that people who say, oh, I am, I suffer from depression and take their pills. And then they think that's okay. I, do, I don't agree with that. I think you can say you're depressed if you have your f health fully, fully in order. Most people that say they're depressed are overweight. Uh, most people that are depressed, uh, you know, their sleep is messed up. Some people uh, who are overweight, they have thyroid issues. And, you know, some people say, oh, that's not my fault. Okay, it's not my fault. I got an autoimmune condition. Like, I, I didn't ask for it. It just happened. You know, auto, your autoimmune system can be very finicky and it can be very funny. And things can kind of sprout up at different times. I didn't ask for it. You know, I could have listen to the doctors like I should have, you know, like a good boy, listen to the doctors. Oh, I'm going to be stuck with this for the rest of my life. No, I did my own uh, due diligence. I did my own research and I cleared it. Mm. And by the way, I came back after I ran the marathon because the next day my body was so messed up. It was my, my reward for running a marathon and raising, you know, another $15,000 for the charity that we work with. My reward the next day was my autoimmune condition came back and then I had to spend another two months. And that's how I really knew it was the carnivore diet that fixed it because it came back. And then I spent another two months, once again, carnivore diet and it went. So Why do you think it came back when, because I was pushing my body so, so hard, uh, right? I was pushing my body so hard. And yo, uh, so if you think about it, that's crazy because that means that you were pushing your body so hard in the pre before you started the carnivore mm -hmm. diet and it was leading to that result, but you weren't running a marathon every day. You were just existing as you were. I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of things that could have gone into it. So yeah, there's a lot of things that could have gone into it. Funnily enough, I, I think it was actually one tattoo that caused it. Really? I have this tattoo here. All my tattoos are very, very sort of light. This one, um, you know, I worked with a new tattoo, uh, tattoo artist. It's actually the only one I ever regret. I've got one right here, um, and it's it's a lot heavier. The ink is a lot heavier than the other ones. And after that, basically, you know, a couple months after, that's when I had the issues. Mm -hmm. And my psoriasis first started here on the exact spot. So once again, it can be 101 different reasons. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really matter why I got it. And I think that's what people need to remember. It doesn't matter why you're in your situation. That's not an empowering thought. Oh, it's maybe it was this. or Like, it doesn't, you know, same thing with my Instagram being taken down this morning, you know. I woke up and I'm like, okay, here's the situation. My Insta got taken down. Okay, what are the solutions? And there's 101 different solutions for these things, right? And I also think worst case scenario, I think about worst case scenario, I'm like, 
Okay. You know, who cares? Yeah. So the reason I ran the marathon, because I went on a little side tangent there, is I had a very difficult 2020. And then with the psoriasis, I also ended up getting depression. That's also why I don't think depression, I don't think you get depression for no reason. Because mm -hmm. autoimmune condition is your body quite literally attacking itself. Mm -hmm. So I had this autoimmune condition, then I went into a massive depressive episode and it, you know a lot of old things that came up. I had a very sort of traumatic, difficult upbringing. Um, and I just, once again, I, I had to deal with it. So I had a very difficult 2020 and I will be honest, after September or October of 2020, I was done for two months, like three months. Like I would sit down and I would work, but I, I had nothing in me. Like I genuinely, I was defeated. Uh, and things were running, my businesses were still running. And, you know, once again, that's a, a testament to the incredible team that I have. But I felt like a broken man. And I guess in some senses I was. And I just needed something to prove to myself of how strong I was. Mm -hmm. And I just, I mean, the, the story is kind of stupid how it actually started. It was, it was locked down in London. And usually I don't spend winters in London. But uh, my friend Pete was visiting me from South Africa. So uh, one day, I don't know why, he just decided to go for a run. And he came back and, you know, him and I, I'm very competitive with all my friends. He came back and he was like, oh, I just ran a seven kilometers in this time. And I was like, and he was just like, kind of just being like, a, just kind of being a, a dick about it. But, it, it, you know, in the way you it, you do with your friends. He was feeling himself. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, all right, cool. Hold my drink. And I, I put I put, on, I put on some shoes. I go, I, I try to smoke his time. You know, I do. And because uh, I'm very, 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 very competitive. And, you know, I come back and then that just weirdly got me. I mean, I'd never run more than seven kilometers or I think even five kilometers in my entire life at that wow. point. Uh, I'm just not a big, like long distance person. So then that happens. And then I just start getting into like nice, cute five kilometer runs. Like I do five kilometers and maybe walk, you know, maybe like another 30 minutes. And one day Pete comes back and he did, I think it was 16 kilometers or something. And he shows me his time. And, and and I remember as he was coming back, I was about to leave the house. It was a night for like, once again, a nice cute five kilometer run. And he's fleecing me. He's roasting me, all this stuff. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. This to, like this. I really just, I was not in the mood for a long run, but I had to do it. So I ran the 17 kilometers or whatever it was. And once again, beat the time. And then from there, I was just like, you know what? You don't know what you're capable of. Mm. And I just had a crazy idea. I'm like, I'm going to run a marathon in two weeks with no preparation, no coach, no guidance, no nothing. And I just put it out on my social media. And yeah, two weeks later, uh, I did it. So in everything you just said, there's like, there's two things that really stick out to me. One, it's the questioning authority, questioning what you're told. I feel like it's such an important trait where do you think you learned that from? Questioning authority? I don't know. It's, I guess, I don't, honestly, I, I, I don't know. It was, it was some point in, in my younger years, somewhere at eight or nine or 10 years old. I don't think I've actually said this anywhere, but I was such a shy kid. I was such a quiet, meek kid. And, and to prove this point, I remember like I, I, I didn't really have any friends growing up because also I moved to uh, London when I was like four or five years old. I was from Russia. So I was just, I was just always a very meek kid. I think a lot of it just had to do with like my upbringing as well. My stepdad just being a very um, complicated man, I guess we can say. Um, so I just, I had, I, I had a lot of authority growing up, you know, to the point, you know, uh, to give you some more lighter stories, I guess, uh, to the point if I dropped a fork. You know, I, I was a, you know, not well-mannered boy and I'd spend the night in the garage. So that, I guess I was just always very scared of authority. Mm. Uh, where I really remember there was one story. I got invited to a, 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 a theme park, a roller coaster park when I was eight or nine years old. And I really needed to go to the bathroom. And I was so scared to ask to go to the bathroom. And I remember even um, uh, my friend's parent was like, Oh, do you, either you guys need to go to the bathroom? And I was so scared to speak up. I was so scared to say anything because that was like the way that I was raised. I literally pissed my pants because I was so scared to ask, oh yeah, actually I need to go. Like I was so scared to like nuisance or bother because no one else needed to go to the bathroom. So I was so scared to like nuisance or bother anyone else. Yep. So that was my upbringing, just uh, such a like shy, meek, 
scared to speak up and I don't know what it is. I don't know where it came from, but somewhere around the age of like 10, 11, 12, it just changed. And I guess maybe a lot of it was just anger. And I don't know, I, I guess just my logic kicked in at that point. Would it be fair to say that the authority in your life never gave you the things you wanted? So you then said to yourself, oh, well, is it possible that they're just wrong? Like all authority is wrong or that I should question it more than the average person? Because growing up without a father or a father who's not there and is abusive to you, it's like, well, that's an authority figure and he's wrong all the time. So maybe other authorities are wrong as well. Is that a possibility? You know, if I could speak to my 11 year old self, I think, uh, you know, maybe that was a part of it, but uh, I think also maybe it's just, I think that's also one of the big reasons I have a, a very big issue with bullying. Mm. Uh, it's just, I know what it's like to, and I think it's, it's very interesting. I don't ever use, funnily enough, there's actually one specific kid or, you know, one specific person I went to school with that I think I was 20 when we met up, like we met up, I don't really hang out with too many kids from my school. And funnily enough, uh, the friends that I do hang out with, I have three or four of them very close friends with, uh, they always say the best stock you could have ever bought back in 2016 was being nice to E-Man. Because you meditated in the washroom. In, in the school bathroom. Yeah. I, was, I was alone at lunch. Uh, you know, my friends were, I had entrepreneurial ventures. I had this Instagram account where I used to basically, it was almost, it was an anonymous account until people found out from my school where I would Fuck post. the norm. Fuck the, yeah, there you go. And I used to, it used to be like my sort of journal. It was very cathartic. It used to be a place where I used to write down my thoughts. It was an enormous account. People from my school found out. And that was actually how back in 2014, I got into the world of flipping Instagram accounts. Mm. Uh, so then when kids found out at my school, I mean, they basically just flamed me for, you know, the longest amount. It didn't matter that I was making, you know, $500, $1,000 a month from the side hustle, because then that got me into the world of Telegram groups yeah. uh, and basically buying, selling promotions, buying, selling accounts. That didn't matter, you know, they they flamed me, so. Yeah, so on that point, I started a blog when I was 13 years old, and I was writing, and this woman on the internet says, she's probably like a 34-year-old woman, she's like, there's no way this kid is 13. Um, his parents are writing for him, this is disgusting. And because of that, because of that bullying online, I got so upset, and I stopped blogging for two years. Mm. So what do you say to that 13-year-old kid, or that 15, whatever, how old you were when you had fucked the norm of getting bullied for doing something that's interesting or calling to you. And then they want to continue or they don't. But what would you say to that kid who's listening right now? I don't know. Look, it's, it's tough because the thing is me at 15, when you know everyone was saying this, of course it hurt, it stung. Uh, is that I had that friend back in 2020 who came back and was like, dude, actually, honestly, I'm so sorry. We used to bully you like that. Wow. And he was, I had a lot of respect for him because I don't think anyone else was willing to say that. And I never use the word bullying because I think bullying is someone who, I think it's a very- Makes you a victim. It's victim mentality. Because the thing is, I, it would happen to me and I'm like, I understand this is not a reflection on me. I am merely a reflection of your insecurities. Yeah. But the thing is, I don't know if, I had a, such a difficult uh, upbringing, so I don't know if every 15 year old or 13 year old can have that wisdom. So I didn't take it too personally. I was like, I get it. I am kind of weird for doing this, yeah. right? But also, I guess the other thing is in 2015 or 2013 or whenever, that wasn't as normal. Whereas now I feel as in school, if you're a 15, 14 year old, you know, who has a drop shipping store <laughs> or who has a YouTube, everyone's like, that's sick. Like, you know, you're maybe. like, you're like a, a entrepreneur. Like, I don't know. I just feel as if maybe it's a little cooler these days or it's a little bit more accepted. Like even having a YouTube in 2015, at least, you know, when I was going to school, like that was lame. Like people thought that was, the, you know, would f once again, flame me for it. They thought it was like the most like whack thing ever. Yeah. Whereas I don't know these days if you're 15 years old, uh, I don't know if it's you know if it's if it's considered cooler. But I guess the main thing that I would say is just remember, most of the time it's the people who are cool in high school that by the time they get to 26, 28, most of these people are bums. I'm just being honest, right? Whereas and w whether that's your school optimizes for academics and grades, because there's some schools where it's like if you're the most academic smart you're the cool person, right? And there's some schools where it's like, if you're the most athletic, you're the cool person, or you're the most social. And just, I've found that any one of those skews, they usually don't carry that on, mm. right? Because also there's no need or desire, because here's the thing, when you're 16, 17, 18, the thing is, I don't know if I was like the cool, cool kid at 16, 
And if I had all that val validation from my peers, I mean, there's a lot of my friends that thought I was super cool and thought what I was doing was great. And, you know, as I said, these are the people that, you know, now all have $30,000 watches on their wrists and come on me, uh, come with me uh, when I come to $100,000 trips. And as I said, like, uh, you, you know, like the uh, those friends who were, um, you know, that friend who says, you know, the best investment you could have made uh, back in 2016 was being nice and polite to E-Man. So except for them, everyone else thought uh thought what i was doing was whack so you know i just don't know if it's 16 if i had that same validation i don't know if it's 16 everyone everyone thought what i was doing was cool i don't know if i would have had that same fire and that same drive to then go and win the way that i did mm -hmm. you know a lot of building a bit whether that be building a business or starting a youtube channel or like whatever people set out to do of course it's 50 percent they love it the other 50% is they want to be recognized for something. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if you are recognized for something at the age of 16 or 18, I don't know if you then have the intrinsic motivation to then go and carry that through in your 20s. And I think that's why a lot of people peak in high school. Yeah. Well, I think uh, another interesting point about that, which I never thought about before, was that what's cool changes throughout life, hmm. right? Like right now, it might be cool to start a business in our heads, but in 30 years, it might be cool to spend time with our family. Mm. And so people, I think, I think, I, I think, sorry to cut you no, off. Go I, for I, it. I think that's even, I think in 30 years, that's going to happen a lot with uh, women's perspective, women's perspective. You, you know, you're seeing that a lot, even where in the early 2000s, you see that a lot with sex in the city. It's cool mm. to be the 32, 33 year old, you know, strutting around New York. You've got a high flying uh, job, no kids though. And you're still living that uh, bachelorette lifestyle. I don't know if that's going to be cool in 30 years. So, you know, that's another thing to mention. Yeah, yeah. And, and but it's like just in terms of people in general, it's like, like you mentioned, academics and sports were the cool things when you were young, maybe. But now it's like business for people like you and me. But I just find it interesting how at some points in your journey, you you can be not cool for something. And at other points, you could be really cool, like Mark Zuckerberg, when he was coding, when he was in high school before Facebook was probably not cool at all. And some people don't think he's cool to this day, but I think it's cool what he's built. And and so it's it's um it's just about oh yeah, sorry about what happened earlier because what Mark did to you on no, 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 no. that wasn't Marky Mark. We're good. <laughs> no, but it's just like what what's cool changes. Yeah. But the other thing that I wanted to mention was about the competitive streak inside you showing mm -hmm. and your friend running 16 kilometers and now you say you want to do 17. Where did the competitive streak inside you start? I don't, I don't particularly remember, but I just think it's in everyone. Like, I, or, and especially, uh, you know, I think a lot of people get pressed when I say men or women, but I think it, in the masculine energy, because there's a lot of women who are very masculine in their essence. And I think as long as people understand the polarity, then it kind of helps you understand life. Uh, but as, obviously, as a whole, most men are very masculine in their essence and their nature. So I think if you ask most masculine men, they want to compete and they want to win. And it's funny, I was actually talking to one of my friends. I was explaining this to one of my friends because I was telling them, when once you come up against me in the world of business, I will, I will make it my life's mission to spend years to drive you to a slow, painful death. And the, but and the thing is, these people that I'm up against in business outside of it are my friends. And they're like, but I don't understand, how could you do that to your friend? And I'm like, cause when I go on, you know, I was playing tennis earlier today, when I go on a tennis court, you know, I I, I recently started playing tennis, uh, growing up tennis. If you live in the UK, I don't know, like tennis and skiing is like a very it's rich, rich people. It's like a rich person in the thing. US too. Yeah, so whereas I think in some parts of Europe, it's slightly different. Interesting. Uh, so I don't know, I just, I was never, I never played tennis. I was never good at tennis up until uh, I started making some money. So I played a little bit in 2019 and I'm, I'm starting to take it seriously now. I have one of my friends who, you know, he's also very, very successful uh, and we play tennis and we play tennis. He thrashes me like, and I understand that. I'm like, of course we're competitive, we're playing here. So of course your objective is to beat me in any way possible. And then after that we go out and, you know, we have lunch and, you know, like he's genuinely, I trust my life with him. So it's the same thing in the world of business. There will be people who are friends of mine, but I will make it my life's mission to, in the world of business, embarrass you in the same way I would hope you would do the same for me if we played, you know, if we played tennis or we played pool or we played whatever thing that they're better than me at. Right. So um, 
I just think, I think it's innate in men, but I just think it's been suppressed in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Even just partici- uh, participation medals and all that stuff. I, I just think it's it's terrible conditioning from school because in life you don't get a participation medal for just sh- like for just being there, right? You don't get any awards for just being a part of it, for right. being a part of life. You get you know you get praise and you get medals and you get accolades if you are extraordinary, mm. and you find out what that is. And everyone needs the self awareness to find out what that is. I started this podcast by saying I'm not the best order, and I know that. And of course, look, I I know if a lot of people came on podcasts, I've been uploading on YouTube for a long time. I've been used to speaking on the camera for a long time. I understand if some people came on your podcast, you know, they might even have, they may not not flow as well. And, you know, they may be a little bit more in their head. But I'm talking world-class level. I understand I'm not a world-class order, but I understand I'm world-class in other areas. Mm -hmm. And I understand there's certain things where I was really good at that I started. You know, for example, skiing. I, I went skiing for the first time like seven months ago or uh, whatever, nine months ago, 10 months ago. And I picked it up pretty quickly. And tennis, I've picked it up relatively quickly. I did boxing two years ago for six months, uh, for sorry, six weeks, three times a day with a professional boxer. I was just really bad. you know, Like, and I'm sure with enough hard work and dedication, I could get good, but I'm just very f- uh, flat on my feet. I'm not, you know, I'm not light. I'm not agile. Um, so... I just think being cognizant of it is, is important. So not everyone is going to be extraordinary in the domain of business or entrepreneurship. And I think the other thing is, I think you just need to look at the map in front of you and go, okay, what areas can I be extraordinary and what areas could I not? Because you can be extraordinary in one thing and that leads you to be a multimillionaire and then other areas are not. And that's okay because you just lean on your strengths and that can still get you to the final destination especially entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is such a wide game. Mm-hmm. Whereas like if I'm, if I don't have the abilities sort of naturally to make me a world-class cyclist, or let's say, you know, I'm 183 centimeters. I don't know what that is in feet, but uh, I'm 183 centimeters. I'm not going to be a professional basketball player. Right. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. So, but at least I know that. Yes. So then I can see what areas of my life could I potentially win at. So, I'm very competitive, but I also, I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. And I think a lot of people just need to be a lot more cognizant of that. Well, how do you become more cognizant of the places to improve your life? I don't know. I, I guess, I, I think it comes naturally to people. It's just the modern world that's taken out of people. Because as I said, you get in growing up and now these uh, these days you get like participation medals and you get, and I, I don't know, maybe it's just because like I'm a only child and I just had a difficult upbringing. So I had to be very, just as I said, very aware of where I was lacking, where my strengths were. And I, th- I think it's innate in a lot of people to be self-aware and see where are they good, where are they not good. And I don't know. And, and, and just once you bring more awareness to it, then I, I think that gives you a lot of power. Was there a particular moment in your own life where you could say, I was the most aware or I am the most aware at this point for this reason? I think every every month that goes on. Because in the same way, you know, in 2020, I was less aware than I am now. In 2018, I was less aware than I am now. So I think as every year goes by, I and I'll probably look at myself in 10 years and I'll be like, wow, you quite clearly had no idea what the hell was going on. And I'll probably look at myself, you know, because th- there's also even uh, opinions that I hold where I am a person that speaks in absolutes. And I think that really, really pisses people off. And I, I also do it on purpose as well. And I've been doing it for years. I've been doing this since the age of, you know, even I, I was 14 when I was telling my friend's parents, my college is a scam. And that's, and by the way, that's not a statement that is 100% true. In, I mean, look, in my belief, it's a statement that's, you know, 80% true, but there are some nuances and some caveats, but I like to, some, I, sometimes I like to speak in absolutes because I know if someone's uh, spoken absolutes to me, I, I, I wouldn't get triggered by it. I'd sort of, you know, lean into it a little bit more. Like even, I'll give you a perfect example. My, my friend Jordan, when we were hanging out the other day, he knows I'm very like anti-vegan mm. and, and he's vegan. He's been vegan for five years. So he goes, I'm obviously, I don't agree with you, but I'm curious, why do you say this? And like, I guess that's just my, the way that I do things as well. So, um, 
yeah, you know, sometimes I, I like to speak in absolutes, but I am also aware I speak in absolutes because I have full conviction that what I'm saying is true, but that is full conviction today. That won't be full conviction in five or 10 years. But I also think there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I just think things, it's in the same way you get these, all these comedians that these days have to like feel as though they're, uh, you know, uh, stepping on eggshells. Qualify their statements. Uh, exactly. I feel as though if I had to prelude everything I say on this podcast by, by the way, this is my opinion and maybe things change. And by the way, maybe what I'm saying isn't true. Like, I just feel as though thing, you, you feel like constricted. Like I speak in absolute, I speak in absolutes about what I believe, or at least the things that I have absolute conviction that uh, is true today. But that may not be the case in five or 10 years. Yeah. It's strong in your beliefs today, but open to new perspectives. And, and that's one thing I, I learned from doing research for this podcast was you talking to feminists or people you might not agree with and being able to be friends with them at the end of it, at the end of a dinner. Yeah. And that's something one might not expect given the amount of absolutes you speak in, but it's cool hearing your perspective on absolutes as well. Like, like I'll give you a perfect example. I was in, uh, and I, look, I have a lot of friends that I wholeheartedly disagree with, but it's okay. You know, I was in uh, Saint-Tropez with a bunch of, uh, and by the way, ever, relax. I just, I like to say words that trigger people because as I said, for me, if you're triggered by it, it says more about you than it does me. You know, I was in uh, Saint-Tropez with, you know, eight, 10 girls and a lot of them study in New York. So I like to call them feminazis, <laughs> right? And we disagree on so much stuff, but we can still hang out because I understand their worldview is shaped on how they were brought up. My worldview is shaped on how I was brought up. Maybe if I was brought up as one of four kids to a beautiful, happy marriage in America or in New York, for example, or you know, California, maybe my views would be a lot different than I if I was the son of a single mom, biological father, alcoholic, abusive, grew up for the first four years of my life, moved to London. Who knows? You know? So I don't I don't judge people for their beliefs. I understand that it comes from somewhere. And I'm also smart enough to know that my opinions could change very drastically in the next five, 10 years. Yeah. So in the interview you did with Sneeko last night or two nights ago, um, you said that something really interesting, which was that you, when you're on other podcasts, you feel like you're giving 20% of your, what you're saying is ego. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what the 80% was, but you were saying, yeah, like I'm just trying to be this person mm. and 20% of his ego. And I thought that was so fascinating. Yeah. So I, I think... Because I, 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 said, I said to Sneeko, him and I have a big ego. And he was like, oh, I don't think you have a big ego. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It depends because I, but here's the thing as well. It, this is always a massive, massive mind fuck to me. Because I'm like, where's the difference between ego and where's the difference between ego and your life? Mm. Because, for example, someone, I might look back and I'm be like, oh, did I have to mention the fact that I spent 100K shopping the other day? Or, you know, it's $100,000, I mean, for the flights, for, you know, then the $10,000 a night villa, you know, once we come back to Miami and the yachts and the fun stuff I'm doing with my team, you know. It's a Do you say that stuff because part of you feels like you're not getting credit for it? So that's the thing. For me, it, it, it's a mindfuck because I'm like, part of me is like, I'm just speaking the, like, I'm just trying to give people context. Like, for me, it's tough because it's like, am I speaking out of ego or is it out of context? Yeah. And that's the thing that I always struggle with because I'm like, did I say that because I felt like I needed to get validated in validation but then i'm like but no because i know that people can just look at my like people can look at my youtube videos people can people know that i'm I'm doing okay in life i guess you could say and then the other part of me is like am i just giving context because i'm trying to answer the question so it's always like a, a mind fuck in my mind so yeah i don't know I, I can definitely look back at 2018 2019 and as i said if i meet you know if i met you or i met you know uh, a fellow entrepreneur or, or something like that and i was chatting with them probably within the first 20 minutes, I would find a way to tell them how much money I was making. Yeah. And even though I'm, you know, compared to 2018, 2019, I'm making almost 10 times as much money. If I meet a, if I meet a person and they genuinely don't know who I am, like, and, and this happens a lot in, in London, you know, uh, when my friends invite me, um, you know, to some of these uh, old money establishments and, you know, everyone goes around the room and says what they do. Like, I don't, for someone I don't know, like I just, unless it's an intimate group, you know, it's four people or something like that. If it's a, a big table, a lot of times I'm just not really bothered to, uh, to talk about myself. So I'll say, you know, I work for IG Media or I work, I work for a company called Agency Flow, right? Uh, insinuating that I don't own the company. 
And I also like to see how people react when they hear that or they hear that I've never been to college or dropped out of school. And uh, I think I also get, I think between that and a lot of times they'll also follow up with a question, what does your dad do? And I'm like, I don't know. I've never met him. So, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's the ego thing is I, I dance with it a lot because I don't know when it, is it me giving context or is it me feeling like I need someone to prove? Because the 2019 example, I know that's fully me feeling like I have something to prove. But in a lot of areas of my life, I feel as though I'm over that and I've gotten past that stage. But then I say things and I'm like, I don't know, did I say that just because I, because I'm also a very detail oriented person. Yeah. My team always, I think that's also one of the reasons that um, we've grown this year on YouTube is because my my team last year were always like, you have this uh, beautiful ability to talk about random context for four minutes before you start a video <laughs> that because for me i'm such a detailed person yeah. and there's things and I've, i see it a lot it, I, it has helped me a lot in life especially when it comes to meeting certain individuals at a high level because there's a lot of people that look at certain people at a high level and you know i'm not the biggest fan of networking and i try to keep my circle relatively small and there's a lot of people even on youtube you know who claim to be this or that, and most people can't discern whether they're, most people just think they're real and just take things at face value, whereas I pick up on the smallest inconsistencies before I ever agree to meet with anyone, because I, I realize if I meet someone, it's a reflection on me, mm. right? If I'm friends with someone, it says just as much about me as it does about them. So That's I have true. to be very, very careful who I'm around. So I'll do a bit of research on, on people, or I'll get, a lot of times I'll get, Whatever my team, <laughs> people in my team to background checks to do a bit of research about people, Fair. and you know I pick up on a lot of inconsistency. Yeah. I, that's just the way I am, and I'm just a very, very, very detail uh, oriented person. And as I said, if I can pick up on uh, inconsistencies where someone says this once and this another time, and I get it if it's two different years or something and their life has changed, but. I can pick up on, on these small little things and I pick up details and I remember details for years. So uh, sometimes I project that uh, when I'm uh, recording videos or doing podcasts, like I like to give the smallest little specific details. And um, yeah, I think as well, that's why I lo sometimes I end up talking about things uh, and I go into detail and most of the time people just you know, don't care. <laughs> I think that only time will be able to tell in five years or 10 years, what the truth of that and only you, you'll really know. Mm. And I think that's important. But I want to ask about how power has kind of shifted in society and money has shifted in society. And what I mean by that is like, never before in human history has a 22 year old or a 25 year old been able to amass massive, for it's been very rare for those to be the elders in society. And today we have people like Mark Zuckerberg, people like Elon Musk when you're just selling, people like you who are young, but now your mom is looking up to you when the waiter is coming and when you're 19 years old paying for the steak dinner, your mom is saying, you should be the waiter right now. Mm -hmm. And so how do you think that switches dynamic in society when young people have more power and are being looked up to and the elders are sometimes being left behind? Uh, I think it's a it's an interesting social experiment we're in right now because as well, it's v look. I, there are some people that try to, try to there's some people that try to stay in the shadows, and I will say a lot of times those people are doing things that are illegal uh, in terms of not, and I, I don't necessarily mean showing off uh, on social media, but just posting about their life. Like most people who are young and making money, post about their life. Some people post about it more, some people post about it less, some people don't post at all, but as I said, usually I find that's for other reasons. But the point is, it's a very interesting situation where you get the ego stroke or you get the validation of making money and then you also get the validation of showing, uh, either telling people how much money you make or showing people how much money you make in some form or fashion. And we've never had that before. And it's very, very interesting. And the other very interesting thing is if I, if I was living in you know, a generation, you know, if I was living even 20 years ago or 30 years ago and I was making the money that I'm making, right? A million, million, a half a month or whatever the equivalent is back then. I would think that I am the richest person on earth mm -hmm. in my, at 22. 
Now, being 22 years old, I am very cognizant of the fact that there are many, many people far, far richer than I am. So it's a very interesting game because you are, everyone's, I think, in a sense, trying to play a game or trying to win at the game, and the game is unwinnable because there's always someone who has more than you in a specific uh, domain, right? Because the other thing that I look at is there's a lot of people that make more money than me. I wouldn't want to trade places with any of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some people where I really admire what they what they did, but anyone, I'll be honest, because sometimes I guess uh, it gets a little frustrating for me because I get compared to a lot of people or I get put up against certain people. And I think people forget that they're 10, 15 years older than I am. And I'm like, look at what they were doing at 22. It's There's not even a question. So my my perspective is I'm trying to be multifaceted. I try to get to as close to a 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 in as many areas of my life as possible. But the reason I, you know, the reason that I bring that up is I think that gives you a level of sanity. Whereas if you're trying to just compare yourself to one specific attribute of a person, let's say how many followers someone has or how much money someone makes, there's always someone, <laughs> there's always someone out there with a bigger dick than you, yeah. right? And it's 20 or 30 years ago, you couldn't know that. Yeah. Whereas these days, it, it's very in your face. You always realize this, there's someone who's just had a bigger W than you. There's always someone who's had a bigger de- a year than you. There's always someone out there that's killing it, at least in one specific area of your life than you are. So, you know, I think it makes it... um Unless you've got a, a good level of wisdom, I think it, you know, it's a definitely a bit of a brain fuck. Mm. But what about like old people in society in general? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think they understand there's certain tools and certain resources that have been afforded to us that have never been afforded before. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, I could not have had this level of success if I lived in the 1980s. Because let's say, for example, if I started my agency, you know, my advertising agency, which was a viable business model back then, first of all, to even get that knowledge, that knowledge was gatekept by colleges. Mm-hmm. Back then, colleges, that is where you got that sort of information, the marketing information. Where So that's number one. And number two, I would have had to hire employees because there's no, there wasn't really a contractors back then, right? Of course, there was like service providers to big companies and this, that, but like no one's going to work for you as a part-time contractor. You need to see them in person. Exactly. And and operate with them. And that's the thing, you know, also in the 1980s, it's not like you could have hired someone in Philippines to deliver services for you. It's not like you could have hired someone in Colombia or Serbia or Romania or South Africa or wherever. (laughs) So it would have had to be someone in your city. So it's not like in the 1980s, I could have just started my agency at 16 with no money. I could have hired talent from all around the world and I could have delivered cl- services to clients in any, literally any country in the world. So it's just like, I understand my privilege in the sense of the time that, and, you know, priv- I hate, I absolutely hate when people say, cause I see a lot of people, especially a lot of like, you know, a liberal, very woke people who are like, I understand my privilege. And, you know, I get this a lot. Uh, oh, you're a white such and such, uh, you're a white male. And I'm like, I, I'm going to be honest, I don't think that had literally any effect on anything I did in life. I mean, like I grew up, there. there's nothing on earth, there's quite literally, uh, there's not, uh, there, there's quite literally not a, a worse advantage in life. And all you need to do is look, look at the statistics than being the mother of a single, uh, the son of a, or sorry, the uh, kid of a single mother. Mm-hmm. Like that is by far the worst advantage you could have had in life. And I have fallen under that uh, demographic. So when I say privilege, I, I'm always, it gives me like the heebie-jeebies because I see so many people uh, and I've, it was luck, you know, like that you were born in this timing, time. timing, timing, uh, timing and luck. And, and yeah. by the way, uh, some people are afraid to use that word luck. I, I sometimes luck's on your side. Sometimes it's not. And you, you made know, the and, most of it. And I'm I made the most. Say, of it. Yeah. I'm it, not saying it like it's a bad thing. I'm exactly. It, like you were put in a great circumstance for your skills, for your for your mindset. And you executed on it mm-hmm. and you reaped incredible and continue to reap incredible rewards. Right place, right time. And. As I said, I'm I'm aware of that and I know that and I hope that, you know, any of the older generation that sometimes look at it and I think a lot of times they're also very s- skeptical. Mm. They're like, oh, how could he amass that amount of wealth or, you know, do this or this? And it's just we are afforded the luxury of opportunities that, you know, our parents or grandparents weren't afforded. Mm. And we're very, very blessed and we're very, very lucky to have that in our life. So, yeah, you know, I, I think... Um, it's different. And by the way, look, it's in the same thing. If you were living in the 1890s, it was a hell of a lot harder to start a business than it was in even, you know, 1970s or 1980s. 
So it's just, I, I believe, you know, as time goes on and on and, you know, things might start to change, you know, we'll see the way things go in the next 10 years with, you know, uh, the social credit scores and all the other stuff. So, you know, we'll see, maybe it start, might start tapering off and going in a bad direction, but as it seems like every single year that goes on, there's more and more opportunity. And in the, in one way, things get harder, but in another way, the playing field gets even more uh, leveled and even. It, it's funny because people continue to be pessimistic about the world. They have been for the last 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. But society for the global population has continued to get better. More people have gotten freedoms. More people have gotten schools and education. More people have been alive because of childhood infant mortality rates like the world has gotten better by no no grand plan by anyone, but continually people are saying, oh, it's going to be worse. And, and it might be. There, there might be a nuclear winter or there might be an asteroid that hits. But I think believing that is also like it's hurting your own psyche. Because even if that's true, what are you going to do about it in this moment? Yeah, I think once again, it comes down to the advantages, disadvantages. And in the same way, everyone needs to look at their life and go, okay, what do I have a competitive advantage in? What do I not have an advantage in? They need to look at the world and understand that things are, I mean, look, things are about to get, in my opinion, bad, bad. Really? Why do you think so? Okay, just look at energy prices in Europe, right? And look at just look at energy prices in Europe. We're about to go into the worst recession that I think we would have seen in 100 years. But once again, if you know how to play it right, you'll come on the right side of history. And I think that's, it's things have always been like that. And I think if you look back through history, there's always key decisions that you could have made. And also, once again, it comes to time and, and, and luck. And I think, for example, you know, even me living in London, I, I lived in London and I just saw things were going in the wrong direction. And even just looking at the way crime has, uh, uh, has the direction crime has gone there and just looking at sort of where the city is heading, obviously energy prices as well, which once again, if you, you need to get to a level where that doesn't matter. But unfortunately, a lot of people aren't there. And it's going to be, you know, they've been saying something for a couple of years now. It's going to be a dark winter. And once again, it, I guess all this stuff depends on your worldview. And I think a lot of this stuff depends on your worldview and depends on whether you think governments all act on their own, basically how the world is run. They said dark winter to implant a certain people uh, thought in people's mind. And that's because it will literally be a dark winter. A lot of people will have to decide do I keep the heating on or, or do I keep the lights on? And it's already starting to happen. And this winter is going to be a bad, bad, bad one for many, many, many people. And between that, between uh, the supply chain crisis, between food shortages and a lot of the food shortage stuff, you know, a lot of it was was planned. And there was, a lot of it was some very, very sketchy behavior. So we've got this playing field where we're about to go into a really, really, really bad time. Yet there's... 14 year olds who are getting paid $2,000 a month from one client to do t TikTok redistribution from, so you know what I mean? Like, so it's, there's this juxtaposition and it's just because, th you know, as a whole macro, we're about to go into a dark period. That doesn't mean that you can't win. Mm -hmm. There's always winners in every situation. So the opportunity is always there. And by the way, the opportunity has been there for hundreds of years. There's, there's always an opportunity mm -hmm. if you know for the right places to look for it. So, so what should people do? There's 101 different things that you can do if, once again, if you if you look at the right opportunities. I think if you're young, use the internet in some sort, some some sort of capacity. And, you know, I think a lot of people also focus on being multimillionaires. Like I always said, I'm exactly where I thought I would be. I'm just 10 years ahead of time. I thought, I genuinely told my uh, friend's parents and stuff like that, I thought when I was turned 18, I would become a real estate agent. I thought I'd be a real estate agent. And I knew that I would probably be slumming it. I, I thought I would still be maybe light level of success or, you know, just living a normal life at 21, 22, learning the ropes, really, you know, maybe starting to hit my first 100K year and then starting to learn, you know, uh, properties and investment and this and that. So when were you when you believe that? I was 14, 15. 14, Yeah, 15. like I thought, because I was, uh, when I was 15, I used to watch. Um, and Cody? No, uh, I used to watch Million Dollar Listings. Wow. The Million Dollar Listings, uh, the New York one. And I used to like show my mom, I'm like, look, look how much they just made, like blah, blah, all this stuff. So you know, when I started it, I never went in. And I think that's also one of the other issues with the world we live in. It's the expectations have gone up so much. It's yeah. now if you don't make a million dollars in your teens, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. And there's a big difference because I'm always a big proponent of making 100K a year, 
or making 50K a year. There's a big, big difference between making 50K a year, 100K a year compared to a million a year. Mm -hmm. A million a year, you need to be an entrepreneur, right? You need to be a business owner, right? And of course, you know, I mean, there's some streamers that make it and so, but I'm talking in the realm of business. Whereas to make 50K a year, you can be a contractor that's very good at something, you know, and you work with three, four clients and help them fine tune things. You can be a thumbnail expert. You can be a a uh, remote lawyer that just helps people with their contracts rather than them having to go to law firms and pay five times the fee just because you're working with a law firm. You can be a, there's 101 different things that you can be. And as I said, the internet has really made that possible. So to make 50 to 100K a year, I just think, you know, if you decide, and the other thing, because everyone wants to, you know, shit on working a job, find the right company, you know, find the right company where you actually have growth potential. And if all these things are in place, then, it doesn't matter the macro. I think things are looking really, really bleak. There's opportunity. Yeah. Well, the I think the important piece that you touched on was the expectations of it. And even when it's just the micro habits where it's like people or it's easy to want to go to the gym. So then in one week you look back and you're like, wow, like I expect to get jacked by this point. But that's not the right way to look at it. You, you got to go to the gym with no expectations. Every time I've seen progress in life, whether it's this podcast, it's going to the gym, it's meditating, it's because I didn't expect anything to come out of it. I was doing the right actions with no expectations. Mm. What about you? Like when in your life have you done the right thing with no expectations and it l led to an extraordinary outcome? Yeah, I think uh, starting my business, you know, starting my agency back in 2016, which I didn't think it was an agency. Like I did... You know, I wasn't like, oh, I'm starting, a, I'm an online entrepreneur. I'm, a, I'm just like, okay, so there's businesses that will pay me for something that I'm good at, which at the time, you know, I was, I flipped Instagram accounts. Then I started getting really into the gym. So then I started like PTing some of my friend's parents and, you know, talking to people at the gym and, you know, convincing them to sign PT packages with me and all this whole stuff. And from there, I started picking up a camera and started learning photo video. So at the time, I was just like, okay, these businesses are going to pay me for photo video and they pay me a monthly fee. And that's just all it was in my mind. I was just like a service provider. I wasn't uh, on track to become a multimillionaire. I wasn't gonna be a uh, this or a that. I was just like, I'm just putting one foot forward in front of the other. And I didn't really have any, I had goals, but I didn't have expectations and I didn't really put a label on it. And I think especially when you're in your early stages, it's important to not really put a label on things and just, you know, just take it as, as it is really and just, what labels could you have put on it? Okay, I'm now a business owner. I'm now an online entrepreneur. I am, you know, 100K, you know, I am a million a year earner. I'm like, no, like I got to earn my stripes. Right. And that's really what it was. It's just like you go into it and you realize that you need to earn your stripes. And the other thing is, I think everyone, it's not good. And as I said, because some people will be like, oh, yeah, but you tell everyone that it's relatively easy to make 100K a year. And I'm like, it's not easy. It's, it's simple. And it's I, in my personal experience in the domain of being an online boutique agency, picking a service that people are, are that are in demand, picking a service that's in demand and offering it to businesses, because obviously for a business, if you're paying 1200, 1500, 2500, a lot of times even $5,000 a month to a service provider, they're thinking about it from their, you know, I'm an employee. I can't imagine spending $3,000 a month on a service, not realizing their businesses out there that have 300,000 a month in expenses. It's just one little blip on their expense sheet. So, you know, I could have, uh, in, in that example, I could have, you know, uh, labeled myself, oh, I'm an online business owner, I'm a such and such. I just put one foot forward in front of another. So I think as well, going back to my last point, there's a big difference between like making 50 or 100,000 a year. I just think that's, and I know sometimes it's very difficult because I, I come across, I may come across a little insensitive when I tell people it's not that hard. Maybe that's just because I'd, I'd walk that path so many years ago and I just seen so many others do it. So I, I understand sometimes it can come across a little insensitive, but I just think with the right plan, it's, it's with the right plan, with the right business model, not messing yourself up by thinking that you're going to, you know, you're going to start with $3,000. You're going to become a Forex trader and, you know, get to hundred K like it, just knowing looking at being able to look at things objectively, that's not the most difficult thing to do. I've never seen anyone properly stick at it for two years and not hit $10,000 a month. I, I genuinely have never seen it. So that's that. But to become a, a millionaire, to, like to make a million dollars a year, 
that is a different game, mm. right? And I just think people should let go of their expectations. You know, people want to do it in two years. Who knows? Maybe it might take 10 years. What's your other option? Yeah. Like, who cares? How has your own view of yourself changed as you've progressed the totem pole to now making a million dollars a month? I actually, it's funny. I was, I was thinking about this earlier. I remember, you know, back in 2018, 2019, I'm like, oh, man, I wonder what it's like to make a million a month. Like, because that was always like, I guess once you hit 100K a month, like that's like the next thing. And your mind is like, oh, my God, like if you make a million a month, like that's, and it, it, funnily enough, the guy, the the people I was looking at that were making a million a month, this is a lot of thing. A lot of times, what people don't tell you, it's like they're only profiting like two hundred fifty. That was revenue. That that, was yeah, because they'll month. yeah they'll say that like, they're, they're, and that's also why now I look back and I'm like, the, the, a lot of people that I was like looking at, they were saying they were doing those number numbers. They're like, they weren't living a good life. Like, wow. like they weren't. First of all, they were working so much, and second, I never saw any of them like, for example, flying private. And like, I do not care what anyone says. I'm frugal. I'm humble. Like, I get it. Not everyone is into, like, I'm very into expensive clothes. There's things that a lot of wealthy people are into. Like, for example, cars. I just, I don't really care. Maybe it's, you know, living in Dubai. It's just driving stressful. Living in London. It's just having a car is the worst thing ever. So maybe it was part of those things. But like, there's no, there's not a single person, a person I know that in honest, genuine truth can say that they would rather fly commercial than private. And if you're making a, a million dollars a month, you're gonna be flying private. Like it doesn't matter if you spend a hundred thousand a month on it, it, you're gonna be flying private because it's just it's one of those things where you know I'll give you like I had to fly from if I wanted to get to a wedding I would have had to fly from Dubai, Dubai to uh, Barcelona, Barcelona to Mexico City, Mexico City to then the other little obscure city where my employee's wedding is. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I just flew, you know, straight from uh, Dubai, Miami on Emirates, first class, sweet, nice, comfortable, hang out here for a week, you know, get to see some people and then, you know, show up five minutes before my flight, get on the jet, go there, hang out with my team for three days, wedding, fly back. You know, it's it's a comfort that is, you know, it's it's great, you know, and there's certain comforts like that. So the reason I say that is because when I was looking back in 2018, 2019, a lot of people that I was looking up to or like man, I can't believe once I reached that level, a lot of them didn't even, uh, it wasn't what it seemed. And I think that's also another thing people need to look at online is I think uh, I've seen a lot of people and they're like, oh, I, they talk down on people who are skeptical. I think it's good to be skeptical. I think in the online space, it's, uh, uh, it should be uh, guilty until proven innocent. I think you should go in and really like, look at what someone says, look at the way they live, look at, look at their patterns, look at their story. And just go in skeptical. And once you know they're the truth, then, you know, then give them your full wholehearted trust. So, you know, now I'm in a position where I was in 2018. I just started, I've basically realized the people that I thought were so smart really aren't smart. Mm -hmm. And I, a lot of times in podcasts, will tell people I'm actually not really that intelligent of a person. I just walk the path and with a bit of luck and a bit of timing and, you know, the whole sort of concoction all mixed up. I'm in the position that I am. So, yeah, I just think uh, my view of myself is as each year sort of goes on, I, I guess in a sense, I almost think a little less of myself because mm. I'm like, I, you know, I understand the concoction and everything that went in that was had to happen to make this possible. And I understand that even the people, you know, the next milestone is making 100 million a year. And I understand that that's not necessarily they're more intelligent. I understand for me personally in my journey, it's like, okay, they found an opportunity that is big enough and they found the, uh, you know, the right team. And, you know, that's really, for example, what I'm focusing on with my software company, like that is the hundred hundreds or billion opportunity. That's the real focus at the moment. And it's just, I know if I find the right team and we have the right product and we, you know, um, you know, we tweak and we, uh, look at what the market wants and respond to what the market wants, then we're going to get there. So it's just, I think you look at things a little bit more objectively, the more successful you get, because you understand that, you know, it's um, not everyone, including myself, is this superstar, or this rock star that people think like, I'm not perfect. I wake up in the first 45 minutes. I don't want to talk to anyone. I'm like, I'm already naturally an introvert, like, especially, you know, in the morning. So I think um, knowing that is, uh, can be very sort of uh, calming to people watching. You mentioned in the Sneeko interview 
that you keep going at this point as being a mental illness. Mm -hmm. What do you think is stopping you from looking at the mental illness and and evaluating it? Uh, well, you mentioned, like, for example, would you say that you know Michael Jordan is someone to look up to? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Tiger Woods, the same, right? Yeah, it, so, it's, it's a nuanced perspective. Yeah, so it, it's, you know, would you say that, um, you know, Elon Musk is someone to look up to? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Yeah, you know. So, you have this quote here. The best of the best, Steve Jobs, Michael Jordan, Amy Winehouse, they're tapping into the divine. Yeah. God is flowing through them. Yeah. So I think that's a, an appropriate time to bring that up. is Because when you're doing business, it must feel, when even when you're doing your mental illness, quote unquote, you're tapping into the divine. Is that hundred yeah, percent? I mean, look, when, when when I'm on calls with my team and I'm in meetings with my team and I see what we're doing and it, like it feels like an orchestra, everything is just flowing in the right. And you know, it's funny. My COO at one of my companies or my co-founder of my software company, sometimes I'll look at new features we've rolled out. I'll look at things that we'll do, and I'm like, I'll literally be mid, uh, uh, you know, mid meeting with some of my team. You know, there might be 15, 20 of us. At the end of month meetings, uh, you know, for one company, there might be 50 of us. And I'll be like, this is this is magic. Like to me, this is the greatest high I could ever, see, you know, feel on earth. And I've always said to people, I've always said this to a lot of entrepreneurs, especially online entrepreneurs, because they get, I find this happens a lot between sort of half a million dollars a year and a couple like low, you know, one to two million a year. A lot of online entrepreneurs start to get really burnt out and depressed. And I always tell them it's because you have a shit team. Mm. Like if I didn't have the team that I have, I would have quit by now. Like I would have just gone out the game. And so, you know, when it comes to the mil uh, mental illness aspect of it, in some senses, some people think Michael Jordan is a you know inspiration. Some people think that uh, Tiger Woods is. Some people think that Elon Musk is. In some aspects of life, they're not winning, right? So it's, I think, although I try to do a lot for, making sure that my fitness is as best as it could be, my dating life, my entrepreneurship, my sort of all areas of my life, my philanthropy, like everything's at a good, even balance. There are some areas of my life that are very important to people. For example, you know, I don't know, peace or stillness or calm that I'm a two out of 10. I don't have a lot of peace in my life. I don't have a lot of stillness in my life. I don't have a lot, a lot of calm in my life. You know, I don't, everyone wants to, sit on the beach or everyone wants to live this incredible lifestyle. Everyone wants to be in a $10,000 a night villa and, you know, sit on the beach and uh, relax. And it's like, I can't do that. Hmm. So it's almost as if you get all these incredible things and that doesn't mean I'm still not going to enjoy the fruits of my labor, but the, my fruits of my labor, I almost can't, I can't enjoy the fruits because of the labor, hmm. because, because the labor is, it's almost, I'm almost enslaved to it, right? Like there's, you know, a lot of times the thing that you love most will consume you and it will, it, it will, yeah, it's, it's almost like your master. Mm -hmm. So I don't sit on the beach and I'm like, oh, what a great life. You know, there's moments of gratitude. There's, especially there's certain specific things where like, um, things from the past come up or conversations with my mom or promises I made to my mom or promises that I made to myself, they inspire me and they motivate me and they make me feel grateful for the position I'm in. But I'll be honest, those are very seldom. And I think if you speak to anyone who's successful, they'll tell you the same things. And but once again, maybe this is a perspective in five years, I look back at it, I'm like, oh, well, that was just a fault of your own. You didn't have enough gratitude, but it's, I don't know, it's like, you know, it's tough for a soldier who's, you know, in the middle of war, or even a commander who's in the middle of war to stop there and be like, I'm just so grateful for, you know, you know, the life that I live and I'm, I'm, I'm alive and some other soldiers aren't alive. And, but you know what I mean? Like it's, I have a lot of chaos and I think uh, if you want to do anything great in life, you're going to inevitably, of course, you're going to have moments of stillness and quiet. And, you know, when I meditate, but as a whole, you're going to have a lot of chaos in your life. And that chaos a lot of times prevents you from having the things that most people truly want, which is most people to live a good life. They want pe uh, peace, stillness, feelings of being present. That's what they really want connection, love, whereas, uh, you know, the things that they think they want a lot of times actually conflict with those. Hmm. And it seems like you get your connection and love at least through creating, running the business as well as through your mom, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But like you can, you can have some of those aspects 
I can have some, but as I said, not in the same way right. that a, a lot of other people can. Yeah, yeah. not like a monk. Definitely yeah, not. definitely not. What would uh, someone on your team say about you that has surprised you? Um, I don't know. I think it'd be bad. I, I, you know what? I'll ask my team. I'll ask my team that. I think, I, I think just because I'm very self-aware, yeah, I think because I'm very self-aware, there's nothing that they could tell me that I wouldn't know. Hmm. Uh, I guess a better way to put that question might be, if, if your team, what has surprised your team about you or what is, what is the things that are private that you might not show publicly that they, the, they comment on? I don't know if it's, I, I, I'm, well, I mean, one of my team, I, I guess actually going back to one of the initial points, what, what, you know, my CEO, uh, we had to quickly call about something like that and, uh, or uh, quickly call about something. And I was like, I, whatever, I was just chatting with him and I was going to the dinner, I was going to dinner and, you know, I was, as I was getting in the car, he's like, look, he's like, are you in a, are you in a phantom? Like a Rose Rose phantom. And I was like, I was like, yeah, anyway, so we'll like, and, and you know, next, I was with a very, 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 very important person, you know, in the Middle East. And th so I keep a lot of my private life, even though I'm public, I keep it very private. So I guess sometimes my team gets insights into my actual, actual private life. So maybe that, but I just think it's probably, if you join my team, it's not so much what you don't know, it's more reaffirming what you think you know. Mm -hmm. Like, I am a person who, like, I'm I'm switched on all the time, right. right? Like, you you can message me at any time of the day, and, you know, I will say I'm, I'm very slow to respond sometimes, but it, it, you could call me. You know, my team calls me because they know if they need something from me, just call me. I'll pick up any time of the day. So things like that, or probably loyalty. loyalty. I'm probably one of the most loyal people on earth because I understand blo loyalty is black or white. I can't be loyal to two people at the same time, whereas most people think they can be loyal to two people at the same time. I will tell people openly, I'm like, I have to choose, right? And luckily I haven't been put in any situations where the closest people to me, I, ha I have to choose. But for example, like everyone, a lot of people are people pleasers. And they're like, maybe I can save both relationships at the same time. I'm the sort of person where I'm like, who has, who am I loyal to? The other person, it's unfortunate, but that's it. How do you figure out loyalty? Knowing that it's black and white. Like, how do you figure out people to trust or be loyal to? I'm um, shared experiences, okay. you know, shared experiences. And this is why sometimes, uh, look, I don't care about other people, but this is why like the people close to me, I call them out sometimes. I'm like, they're not your friend. I call a lot of people, fr you know, I'll be, cause it's just easier to, I'm like, it's a little weird if you're like, oh, my acquaintance, <laughs> right? But like, if I'm being honest, they're my acquaintance. Yeah. They're not my friend. You're not friends with someone until you've actually gone through something. And people, I've, you know, people have proven this time and time again. And the other thing is, I don't expect any loyalty from my acquaintances. If one of my acquaintances, you know, fucks me over, I'm not upset, I'm not emotional about it because you're not my friend. We've not, we've not gone through anything. I haven't proven myself to you and you haven't proven yourself to me in the same way. This sounds horrible. No one on earth is gonna say this. If I have an acquaintance and I have a friend, I don't want to, but if it comes to it and I have to fuck over the acquaintance to save my friend, you're gone. We have no loyalty. Whereas this person, if this person has been loyal to me for three years and has done this and this and this, I will, whatever, I won't say it publicly on YouTube. <laughs> There's a, I will go to extreme lengths. Gotcha. I, and I have gone to extreme lengths to protect me and protect the people I love. And I understand that you can't give that to everyone as well. Because the other thing is, it, you know, there have been situations in, in you know, people I care about life where I have to come in and I have to solve it. And as I said, these are very extreme lengths mm -hmm. and I have to, you know, I use my resources, whether that be the people I know, where the money I have. And I mean, between those, you can basically, you can do anything from, <laughs> you can solve a lot. You can solve a lot of problems. You know, if you need planes grounded, you can ground planes to that level. And I understand when I'm doing that for someone I, you know, I love, I'm putting myself at risk, mm -hmm. right? There's no, you know, people need to understand. And I understand this very uh, carefully. There's no offense without defense. You know, I think a lot of people, and look, here's the thing, I, I do believe in karma, but outside of karma, I also believe in the fact that if you play offense and the other person knows that it's attack from you, a lot of times they're gonna counter, unless, you know, your enemy is so small, you can just crush it. Mm. But a lot of times there's also no fun in that. Mm. But if I have to protect someone I know, and I have to go to these lengths, then I'm putting myself at risk. 
So I'm not going to put myself at risk for just any random person. So I think that's why, and I, I check my friends sometimes when they're like, oh, because people know when I say friend, you know, I just mean acquaintance, really. Whereas sometimes they'll talk about, I was like, oh, this is, no, they're, they're my friend. And I'm like, they're not your friend. That's an acquaintance. Th that's an acquaintance. Let's call it what it is. Because until you've actually gone through something with someone, they're your acquaintance and that's it. So on that point, it sounds like a, a very much like you're thinking of life as a chessboard or a war mm -hmm. type scenario. What was the last war that you entered into or that you can speak about where, you, what, and what did you learn from it? You don't have to use names, obviously. Look, there's a lot of wars where I, yeah, as I said, I, without speaking about specific situations, the, the reason that I've, I have I have learned the things that I've learned is, as I said, I have engaged in enough uh, situations where it's me versus someone. And by the way, funnily enough, a lot of times, the person, and this is also in the same way, you know, Michael Jordan, uh, it's funny, Michael Jordan, he used to find creative ways to uh, motivate himself. Yeah. You know, he would know that he would just ruminate on the fact that, okay, that seven-year-old is coming to watch me. This may be the only game they can ever afford to see. So I have to be on top performance because not only am I an athlete, I'm a performer at the same time. Yeah. You were going to say something? Yeah, he, he also made up reporters saying things yeah. about him as well. Yeah. So I, you know, and I, I read his uh, biography when I was maybe 14, 15. So I... And so, I use a lot of that same thinking. You know, there's people who probably don't know that I'm engaging with war on them. And by the way, because there's stuff where you need to, whatever. There's, there's stuff where, as I said, you need to, and this is more of where I, if I have to protect myself or people in a more serious way, it's more serious things. I'm not talking, you know, any pulling out the big guns, right? I'm just talking like uh, almost competition. When I say war, I almost say competition. Gotcha. There's people where I'm in competition with them and they almost don't realize it. Right, like maybe they, not in a bad way, they didn't even mean any ill intention, but maybe they made a move and I decided, okay, this is you. Uh, this this is you, you've decided to uh, instigate war with me. Gotcha. And a lot of times they may not even, but I just convinced myself because I know it's it's healthy, right? Yeah. Which is a healthy competition. So there's been even situations where uh, even today there was someone I, you know, and no one will, will know who this is except for the person. There is a offer that I made to someone where I pretty much would have personally handed them half a million dollars, right? They would have gotten that from that side of the deal, which is a very substantial amount of money to them. They came back and I offered them a very, because they came to me and we've done business before and they wanted a they wanted a deal to make 100K. I decided, you know, uh, you know what? We can, I think we, uh, I could uh, position things so out of this deal you can get 500K. Mm. And, you know, this person came back and was like, hmm, Actually, I think I'm getting a wrong part of the deal and, you know, I'm getting a small percentage or like I'm getting a, a you know, I just don't think this is enough. And mind, I'm like, this person fucking crazy. And this person, um, this person, this is maybe two months ago, right? And this person has a uh, social media and a YouTube and stuff like that. And so this person came to me basically being like, you know, I need some money or I want some money. Is there something, is there a way we can do business so I could come up with this sum? And after that, I still love this person to bits, right? Like, and this co comes into like, I can still be friends with the person because we just didn't see eye to eye. That doesn't mean that they've done anything bad to me. I basically decided, okay, what's the areas of life where I, they're beating me. There was one area of life. And I'm like, okay, it's going to be my mission for the next two months. I'm going to surpass this person in this area of life. And I did it actually yesterday. And so there's little mini wars like that mm. where I engage in, and that's more sort of healthy competition. And that's just, I think these are good things in life, right? In the same way, I, the reason I started really taking tennis seriously is my friend James, we were in Bali like uh, six, seven weeks ago. Chess, every single time we played chess, I beat him. Every single time we played tennis, he beat me. So I decided, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going back to Dubai. I'm getting a tennis coach three times a week. I'm going to take this seriously. And because also like him and I are a little, I think him a little bit more than me, like no time when we played chess was I like, oh, let's play for money or let's play for $10,000 or $50,000. It's the love of the game. It, no, but I also understand it, like that I'm just better than him, right? So there's no fun in kicking man when he's down, right. right? Whereas like he's a lot better than me at tennis. So, you know, he was a little cheeky and he was like, oh, play me $10,000, $10,000. I'm like, dude, you know, you're going to win. I'm not going to take this bet. 
So I, I, I basically told him like, in January, we're gonna play for $50,000. We're gonna play a tennis game. And I'm like, I am making my fucking life's mission. I'm going to get good at tennis. I'm going to beat him. This January? This is in January, yeah, in a I, few months. I, I hope someone live streams I mean, it. Maybe I might live stream it. <laughs> right? so, watch so that's it. an example right there, once again, of just like, even with your friend, you decide on war. And I think this, I think it's healthy if it's, if, it's, if it's in a healthy sense. Now, when it comes to more dark, sinister side of things, that I hope, and most people won't need to do that. I don't wish that upon anyone, right? I don't wish that, and there's things in my life and measures in my life that I've had to go to because of my wealth, because of my reach, because of envy, because of jealousy. And I understand these are all parts of life. I don't feel bad for myself because of it. I, I put this upon myself, right? By being public, by making them, I could very easily just make my money and not share my journey. I just, I think maybe it's because I was sharing my journey far before I had money. It's just, it's a part of my life now. So, there's parts of your life that where you have to engage in war that I don't wish upon anyone. And that's more a area of necessity. Mm -hmm. And in those areas, that's where I learned really between that and, and chess, you know, playing a lot of chess growing up. Uh, that's where you really learn the art of war and you really learn that it's not, you can't just be all F offense and with every offense comes a defense and just picking the right battles. Yeah. It's ironic that, your stepdad, I believe, taught you chess growing up, and then you had to pay all these legal fees, which I'm sure when you were 18, 19, was a form of war. Can you yeah, I mean, it's it's funny, right? Because obviously I have, I have a very interesting childhood where uh, I, you know, I have a very interesting childhood where my mom, my dad was about uh, alcoholic abusive, uh, my biological father. My mom, when I was two years old, uh, she was in Moscow, and she met my stepdad, and then they kind of just started dating for like 18 months, two years. Then she moved to London for six months. Basically, they were trialing, like living together and you know, seeing what that was like. And eventually, they ended up getting married. So I moved to London, and my stepdad was a very wealthy man, the most sinister man I've ever met in my entire life. And I met, I've engaged in a lot of war. I've met some very bad, bad people. And maybe I think that's where a, a large por portion of that as well is where I learned it. Because it's funny, growing up, he was obsessed with uh world war one world war two documentaries he was obsessed with the great wars he was uh, you know uh, uh, a great chess player like he he was very you you can you can understand the archetype there right. but anyways my mom married my stepdad and that was one of his brilliant chess moves because he this, oh, man when i realized i'm like fuck i'm doing exactly what my dad did my, my dad moved to um, my stepdad moved to uh dubai when i was eight years old so from eight years old, he lived in Dubai and he was only back in London for, you know, 90 days, 120 days a year, but he was also allowed more days because he had a family. So he, it was just, it was this weird chess move where basically he saved a lot of money on taxes. He wasn't around much and he stayed married to us. And uh, up until uh, the age of, I think it was 10 or 11, uh, he also sent my mom a little money, which was like a measly, measly amount for, uh, uh, for my mom and me. And then eventually he just cut us off entirely. And that was when it started to get really bad. So yeah, it was just this like super weird childhood. And you know, that's why I am where I am today where, you know, my mom, you know, from that point we were, we were fine for two, three years. Cause my mom was always a big, and she even is a big, like a saver and super frugal. So we had enough uh, chestnuts put away um, for a couple years and then things started to get bad. So then I think the first job she took was, um, uh, uh, Harrods in, in London. She was a, a part or uh, full time, but a uh, summer job, um, uh, working in Harrods minimum wage. And then she would come home crying because she wanted to get a full time job there, but she couldn't. Yeah, it was, it was two summers in a row. She wanted to get a full time job, and then you know, towards the end, uh, September, basically they were like, you know, because they do a lot of summer temp jobs, and it's funny. Um, yeah, it's, that's also another funny thing because you know now at Harrods I've spent. 1.2, 1.5 million. And, you know, I, I, I take my mom shopping there all the time. And it's like, you know, it's crazy because uh, sometimes she'll walk through there and this doesn't happen often because she only worked, you know, every, um, uh, you know, uh, for three months a year over the space of two years. But sometimes people from there will be like, oh, what are you doing here? Blah, blah. Wow. And, you know, she's wearing like a, fuck, you know, fucking Hermes Kelly, $25,000 bag and, you know, $100,000 watch. So it's, that's a cool feeling. But, wow. you know, the situation with my stepdad, the day I turned 18, he basically, uh, you know, his lawyers, uh, uh, you know, put a, a letter through the mailbox 
And they were like, uh, they told my mom, you have seven days to leave. And I mean, at that point, my, my, my house was already a shithole. He cut off the warm water. He cut off the heating. Uh, and then when he found out I was building a, um, a business, he cut off the Wi-Fi as well. But that was something that I knew he was, he was doing. Basically, he, because this is also another war move. And, you know, I may or may not have used this war move in, in the past. War of attrition. Mm. When you know you've got more supplies than someone else, you know, and in a lot of ways, you can even just look at what, um, you know, Russia is doing to a lot of Europe right now. When you know that you've got something that is a, a necessity to someone else, or you can play a game for longer than someone else, and you can just let a, another person dwindle and die out, then you know you've got them. It doesn't matter how smart they are, how intelligent they are. So my stepdad, he knew that, okay, because basically what he wanted is, you know, clean divorce. We basically, or my stepmom basically, you know, fucked off and, you know, went back to Russia. And I mean, he, he tried a bunch of crazy, crazy stuff. You know, he basically said that we forged his signature uh, for a visa. So he was trying to get us deported and trying to get our British passports revoked. He said like some, and you know, that's also when I realized the legal system, it's not innocent until proven guilty. It's Guinness, uh, it's guilty until proven innocent. As you mentioned before. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you know, I, that was one of many, many war chess moves that you can use is a war of attrition. Mm -hmm. So obviously my stepdad knew that I started a business, but he didn't know how well it was doing. So anyways, long story short, I think by uh, the time everything was said and done, I'd spent, you know, by the time I was 18, 18, so 18 to 2019, so it was around a year, year and a half. I'd spent maybe two, two hundred fifty thousand dollars on legal fees, and it was it was just stupid stuff. It was it wasn't even like, you know, because I think my mom really could have gone after him, but obviously, you know, a lot of wealthy people know how to hide their money, so it's not like there was a lot of money there to be had. Um, and yeah, my mom, like, she's just a very simple woman. She didn't really go after him. She, the main the money was spent on having to deal with, you know, like just stupid stuff, you know, things like the deportation. And yeah, it's, I definitely have a great disdain for the legal system after that. How do you, your most important tattoo you've said before is my cup runneth over. Yep. How do you maintain that level of peace? Or is that an aspirational quote when you've been through so much hardship? It's an interesting story. I don't, I don't know. Like it's, because I, I get a lot of people that ask me this. I think I'm, I have such a high tolerance for stress and high tolerance for like things just are what they are. Like I don't have ill will on anyone. Like, and I, to be honest. Even your stepdad? Zero. Zero. Wow. Absolutely zero. Always? Or was that a progression that? I just honestly, always. Wow. And it's weird. I don't know what it is. And it, as I said, I think a lot of people will go on podcasts and make up reasons for why they did everything they did. And sometimes you just got to say, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why from a young age, I'm, I just looked at things like this is what it is. And I don't know. I, th I think the only one thing I can point to is because I had the interesting childhood of going to private school for my stepdad when, you know, when things were going well, because I had that perspective of going to private school and seeing my friend's parents who were very wealthy, but fucking miserable. So much weird shit going on in, in their households. So much just like, you know, the husband cheating on the wife, wife cheating on the husband, fighting, you know, crazy you stuff. You saw that money didn't buy happiness. I saw that money j doesn't build character, doesn't buy you happiness. It just accentuates who you are. And then I would go home, you know, my friend's parents were just miserable fighting. And then I would go home and my mom was miserable. And I'm like, you guys are living in the same reality, except you know, one has no money and the other has a lot of money. So I'm like, it's maybe that just gave me a very like realistic view of, of, of the world. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess I've just looked at things very objectively always. Wow. Well, dude, I'm so grateful for our time together. And before we go, I, I want you to uh, think about a challenge you'd like to leave the audience with. I find that that uh, gets to the values of the person and can help the audience out as well. Per the person listening. So, yeah, and I, I just want to thank you for your openness, your thoughtfulness, your courage, your your willingness to go through so much in life and still come out of it on the other side as somebody who can speak about it, who can be open about it, and who's still learning and growing. I think that's really remarkable. So, thank well, I you. mean, I will say that's a testament to, you know, I've told you this before, you are an incredible, incredible, uh, you're incredible at what you do, right? You're an incredible podcaster. Uh, you can pull things out of people, and I've really noticed that about you, so... 
yeah, I mean, if we had a brilliant conversation and I'd say majority of it has to do with the quality of questions asked. So I want to thank you for that. I appreciate that. And what challenge can we leave the people with? Uh, look, I'd say, you know, everyone, uh, everyone wants the, you know, the physical challenges of, oh, I, you know, can you do 30 pushups a day for the next 30 days when, you know, no one ever wants to address the mental aspect of it. So, you know, I'd say, could you do 10 minutes of meditation a day for the next two weeks? That's the real challenge. And I think a lot of people have so much chaos in their, and by the way, I've spoken about the chaos in my mind, but I still need to, when time comes, I have chaos in my life, but when time comes and I need to make a critical decision, the only way I can do that is by having a still mind. So most people lack that. And, you know, most people, their world and their life is so frenetic. And, you know, I understand everyone wants to go to the gym or everyone wants to like physically have a representation of I am strong, I am powerful. But meditation is a way to train your mind to be strong and powerful. And that's, to me, that's far more important than than your body. You ended the last podcast telling people to do inner work. It's only right that you end this yeah. podcast telling people to meditate. <laughs> so, Iman, it's been an absolute pleasure. So Thanks grateful so much, for you. You're the man.